Dr. Musehwa has had visiting fellowships at British Telecom Research and Innovation Labs, at Intelligence Business Systems Group, Adastral Park, Ipswich, UK, and fellowship at uh, UNESCO International Center for Theoretical Physics, Triste, Italy, and internship at British Energy PLC, Lancashire, UK. He serves on Botswana government education, science and technology, task team for the Botswana Space Science, strategy over arcing development, and opportunities in space sciences and technologies. He also serves to engage at uh, the Ministry regarding the National Digital Transformation Initiative for Research Science, Technology, Innovation, and Ecosystems through Cyber Infrastructure for Digital Revolution, Capacity, Building, and Digital Skills. Dr. Motsehwa is a member of Botswana Square Kilometer Array an African Very Long Base Interferometer Network Projects and te Technical Committee, the Botswana Open Data, Open Science, ODOS Committee, and the Botswana South Africa Joint Commission on Research, Science, Technology, and Innovation. Regionally, he has been a chair of the Southern African Development Community technical experts, working group, developing and implementing the SADC region cyber infrastructure frameworks. This to develop a shared regional commons of compute data networks and human capital to enhance regional research, innovation and education. And he hosts data and computational intensive projects of regional impact in SADEC, he also engages in the SADEC ICT thematic groups. Dr. Mosehwa also engages in global, regional, national, and institutional innovation ecosystems, development, and linkages. To this end, he participates in the SADEC intellectual property. The biography of uh, Dr. Mosehwa is quite intense. Dr. Mozeho also engages uh, Botswana Qualifications Authority on qualifications and institutional accreditations and the Human Resource Development Council on skills development, research and innovation interventions program. He serves in multiple steering committees and it is my pleasure and honor to welcome Dr. Mozeho. Be here, uh, and, and I think uh, Stemiso maybe left out one little bit, given the new role that I will be taking uh, on, on a very exciting project, or shall I say, initiative across the continent called the African Open Science Platform. And I think this provides a very tantalizing prospect uh, for Africa to have a platform uh, to allow our scientists and our researchers to be at the cutting edge of science in the 21st century all that it entails, and there's a lot of work to be done. So I came here today to, to share with you at least the vision of what this is, and how this plugs into the global dispensation of doing things, and how maybe all of us, all the various actors in the space, what do we need to do to make this vision a reality? So really I'm hoping we can take away from this presentation the vision of what we want to do, and the prospects of what this could do. So I'll be pressed. Okay. For the past month and a half, I've been on a whirlwind tour around the world, setting on the XP. I started off uh, in October in the Czech Republic at the International Conference of Research Infrastructures, and then we went to Leiden for the Fair Convergence Symposium. And we just been in Dallas uh, just last week, and then this week we're in Botswana. Uh, in another conference. I always show this picture. Um, I think I think if you look at the world map, I get a feeling they haven't drawn Africa to the right scale. Given that you can actually fit in all those 
continents in a way. If you were to calculate the area in terms of land mass. Now, this shows us that there is potential and there is challenges and the scale of the problems and the potential that we, we, we can have if, if we address certain things in the continent. And indeed, the challenges themselves are multifaceted, as you can see there. Uh, they are also cross-border. They are also uh, require multiple action. And you can see also that there are some of the challenges that are also global that Africa needs to, to attack. And indeed, if you look at the bottom slide, you see that there are some instruments that Africa has put into place to try to address some of these challenges. Indeed, Africa sees science and technology as vehicles for addressing some of the challenges. There is this TISA policy, the Science and Technology and Innovation Policy for Africa, that really talks to how science can address some of these challenges. There is also the very exciting digital transformation strategy uh, that is well articulated, that also obviously shows how for example, technology can be used to address digital transformation. And then, of course, at the very far left here, you'll see the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. This is profound, provides a prospect for us in the continent trading together. Uh, really, it's about livelihood. So I thought maybe I'll just share with you that even at a continental level, we have a collective vision of how science and technology can address some of these challenges. And of course, everybody's talking about sustainable development goals. And you can see there that there's no way we can attain some of these goals without a very vibrant, transparent, scientific community. A community not only talking to itself, but to society. I think this is critical because you're talking about science for transformation, isn't it? So it's very, very profound and important to mention this. We need to engage society as part of the scientific enterprises that we are developing. And then on the right, on the, on the right hand side there, You'll see that now talking about science and society, the issue of democratizing science, making it accessible to everybody, is very, very important. And also to make it efficient, equitable, and transparent and inclusive. I think these are very, very profound statements because they talk to an open agenda that I'll speak to next. And talking of equity, you can list a number of areas where there is no equity in the continent and in the globe. I mean, look at the stats, very profound. I was just talking yesterday with Clement Onime, uh, discussing how as scientists we write papers, uh, we review them, peer review, and we publish them at a cost. Hmm? We are the one who produce the content. Uh, we also review them, and somebody else is making the money. And these publications are also hidden behind paywalls. Very, very important. But Corona taught us that there is an alternative way. We can actually open up a lot more scientific literature to advance science very rapidly. And look at the fast stats on the other side. Open access, still very good with COVID and COVID-related uh, publications, but critical areas like climate change, a lot of publications are still behind paywalls. Something needs to be done. Very, very important transformation that we need to, to address. And what do we need to do? Look at the far left side, left, right hand side of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the diagram there. We need timely access to scientific data. We need collaborations because we are connected, isn't it? And of course, this issue of technology and knowledge gaps, we need to address these things. All these are critical to enable science for transformation. I think this is my prelude to what I'm trying to address today. There's discussions around science diplomacy. I like these definitions of what science diplomacy is. The use of scientific and technological collaborations among countries and across regions to address common issues and build signed, sound international partnerships. I think that's what we need to address some of those things that I just speculated about at the back there. And also the establishment of large research infrastructures. You can use infrastructure to effect diplomacy, scientific diplomacy. It's very, very common in countries that do not collaborate normally to find avenues of collaborating in some areas through research infrastructures. So that constitutes a science diplomacy. We just in Borno in Czech Republic, very, very profound statement that came out of that conference regarding research infrastructures. I think South Africa has got SARIR, your South African Research Infrastructure Roadmap. There was discussions around global research infrastructures, what needs to be done, including us collaborating to make sure that around the world, we collaborate to, for example, make data available uh, regarding some of the work that we're working on. What is most important is for policymakers to see this as key investments 
and for enabling, uh, obviously, everything else that we need, including socioeconomic support. I really urge colleagues here to look at that document and from various countries to see where you are regarding your preparedness to develop these research infrastructures and how they plug into the global dispensation. And of course, talking of science diplomacy, you can extend that argument towards more open science diplomacy and using that diagram to show us what are the different areas of open science uh, that uh, we can look at. Again, the diagram summarizes very, very well how open science can really affect what we are trying to say here. The society uh, is at the core. Greater awareness, promotion of greater awareness uh, regarding, regarding public discourse. I think it's critical. The efficiency gains of using open science. We are a very small uh, 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 continent regarding, for example, incomes, regarding GDPs. How can we make our dollar go further? Really by optimizing the little we have, doing more with less. So we found that open science promotes efficiency. And if done properly, we have far, far greater efficiency gains. Notwithstanding that we can do innovation faster uh, with sharing research outputs and making them available to others very quickly and very effectively. Of course, the economic benefits are also very, very profound. So that's a very exciting project that mapped out all these things that I really also encourage our colleagues here to look at. And of course, we were also in Leiden as executives of open science platforms to discuss how open science platforms in the world can start collaborating. I think this is key. There's a lot of developments around the world regarding open science platforms. I think South Africa is talking of, thinking of a South African open science cloud. We are talking of an African open science platform. You've got the European open science cloud. You've got others as well. How can we work together towards a vision for a global open science cloud, really to attack problems that you don't need to compete in but collaborate in. I think this is critical. So really, it's very critical for us to look at avenues for making these things work uh, together. Uh, in, in, in the world. You'll see also a, a couple of slides that I've taken from UNESCO. We met with them last week in Botswana to really think about how can we start discussing in these forums the progress made in the implementation of these recommendations. I think some of you may have seen some of the recommenda these recommendations, some of you may not have. But this is a very profound document that was uh, produced collectively by member states to really articulate what open science is and what everybody needs to do to make sure that we are on the same page, you know, progressing towards the vision that we just articulated. Really, I would advise you to look at the instrument, but also the consultative process that took place and the number of commentaries that emanated from the various stakeholders in its formulation. I'm mentioning this because it's actually obligatory for countries to then report on the progress they are making in the, in the implementation of recommendations. By so adopting them, you're obliged to report on them. And these are some of the highlights of the recommendations. You'll see there that it recognizes that there are multiple actors and stakeholders. And of course, all those actors have a role to play. It also talks of the different actions on different levels uh, that, that is required to operationalize uh, the recommendations. And then, of course, it proposes that we come up with innovative ways across the different stages of the scientific process to affect uh, open science. And of course, at the very bottom there, you can see that it calls for development of comprehensive uh, monitoring and evaluation of the, of the framework. And of course, I'm not going to be pedantic and talk about all the pillars. You can appreciate the different pillars of open science uh, for posterity. But you see there that open scientific knowledge is key in all its elements. Uh, the issue of open dialogue, open engagement with society, et cetera, et cetera. The issue of infrastructure that I believe Teresa and CGC are also, are also in, the business, in the business of. And of course, those are some of the key action areas. If I university, we can look at those and say, what are, what are we doing? in this area in terms of the key action areas regarding us uh, personalizing the recommendations. But we see there that the issue of an enabling policy environment is critical. Yeah. We can see that the issue of an enabling policy environment is very critical. The issue of culture, how can we change the culture from the status quo where we are to make sure that we can obviously effectively implement open science? And the issue of international uh, collaboration between the multiple states. Somebody now, somebody, so I'll just go flash quickly through this. And I think this diagram also highlights very quickly some of the challenges we need to address. I'm reiterating this point because I think organizations, ministries, governments, uh, funders, everybody needs to look at this and say, look, here are some of the key areas that we need to address. For example, as a university, what are we doing regarding incentives 
and revision of the criteria for evaluating scientific excellence. When you give those awards at the end of the year, who do you reward? Do you reward scientists who lock, them, who lock themselves up in their offices, produce publications singularly? Or do you also reward those people who share scientific outputs in terms of the data, those data stewards that are also part of the scientific process? Are they hidden in the corner somewhere in the kitchen? Or are they rewarded and, 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 and parted up for the good work that they are doing? This change of conventional scientific culture is critical. There is obviously a natural tension between the individual and the organization society. But we need to find a dispensation where we change culture such that open science uh, permeates across the world. And I want to highlight this because vice chancellors, researchers, deans, researchers need to know about what they need to do regarding the open science recommendations. I mean, look at the top there. There's a call for us to adopt the statements that I just articulated. There's also a call to change the culture, bottom up within organizations. And indeed, there are some toolkits that UNESCO has developed regarding, for example, a checklist of what you need to do, uh, some of the things you can consider regarding funding, some of the things you can reg do regarding policy that you also need to look at. And I, I want to spend time on this uh, step a little bit because we know what this is. We know the elephant in the room. We've got challenges of quality, we've got challenges of quantity, and we've got challenges regarding investment. Garbage in, garbage out. You pay half price, that's what you get. You get full price, you get a limousine. So don't expect to drive a limousine on a half budget. So really, this is a profound statement that we have. There. And of course, opportunities for universities are also articulated there. And of course, we implore governments to consider some of these things. Some of the people here, from, we can see the colleagues from, from SADC are here. Work with your governments to push for some of these things. What are we doing regarding successful implementation of the recommendations? The infrastructure investments, we talked about South Africa and others having research infrastructures roadmaps. What are we doing in terms of investing in open science as part of and parcel of percentage of our GDP in, 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 measured, in measured quantities? And of course, there was some work regarding what we are doing in the continent in open science that provided us the baseline for what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. And, and of course, all this was for me to build up this very exciting slide. Uh, my whole presentation really should be about this slide. That there is a vision for Africa to come to the fore, to come to the table regarding the dispensation of open science as I talked about. And it requires a strategy. It requires a strategy not developed by singular individuals, but by a collective. There was a consultative process that I just shown that culminated in this strategy. In that strategy, there are going to be a number of pillars that all of us and our partners need to look at uh, participating in. The infrastructure business that today we are discussing in CHPC conference. Everybody in the continent needs to be thinking about developing these computational infrastructure so that our scientists do not go to Europe. We don't, we don't incur the brain drain. Uh, I think Kasim is here, he's, he's in the UK. I returned from the UK after 17 years, purposefully. It's tempting to stay there. But those temptations are because we don't have the environment to have our scientists work here. So we need to, to skew that, 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 that particular point. So we need these infrastructures. We do need the data science and AI institutes. We do need collaborative projects, a common research agenda in the continent, especially around areas that you can collaborate in across various areas. And of course, the two networks, the networks for training and the networks for dialogue with society, very, very critical. The operationalization model of the African Open Science Platform will see us having a coordinating hub um, currently based at NRF, that has, has launched this year, but also a number of nodes in the continent that each of these will be maybe looking to be pushing for the implementation of those pillars. And of course, there'll be cross fertilization across the various nodes in the continent. So very, very important that we understand that. And of course, we have a value proposition. I'm gonna take time going through this. I'll share this with you. Why is it that you wanna to come to the party and, and, and join AOSP? We'll see there that, that there are some very great benefits. You've mapped out the different stakeholders. Uh, we also mapped out what AOSP offers. But for us at the very top there, we want to push African scientists to be at the fore. We want to stimulate interactivity. We also want to create these critical masses that we know that we need. And we also want to amplify those impact through commonality of purpose. I think these are very, very important statements. And of course, we articulate also the benefits to governments. How can you work with you to develop those policy instruments into a proper policy that allow your policies in different sectors to talk to each other so that you always have that 
same is wind up in a very short while. But of course, in terms of implementation of the strategy, that's what those are the imperatives. Those are, I'm told that the, the next speaker hasn't, hasn't, hasn't turned up, so I have the liberty uh, for doing Give me two minutes. He's here. Okay, okay. Now, in terms of where we are after one year, a lot is happening. I'm here to excite you about joining ASP. So, a lot has been happening. Um, the most exciting bit is that the call for developing those ASP nodes is out. We've just taken this, the, the, the measure to extend the call to January 15, so that any entity here that has got expertise in the areas that I mentioned can put themselves forward for, for, for implementation of the node. Uh, the call is out also for governing council. We'll have a governing council that will over, provide oversight for everything that we're just talking about, to provide direction in terms of strategy. Uh, the call is right here. Um, go to the website for the, for the, for the ASP website. You'll see it there. But I'll also share it with Tembiso. I was going to talk more about how do we prioritize what to work with in the continent. It has to come from the regions, isn't it? SADC is here. It has to come from the ministers. What is it about your region that you think can be affected to science? And what is it that you already have that can also talk to us? So this diagram, in a way, provides... I'll share this with you. can share with your ministers. That, oh, you already have this strategy. Oh, you have this policy. This is what open science will do for you. And then, of course, that's the language they understand. And then, of course... We attended uh, regional meetings. I was re recently at a retreat with the SADC Secretariat in some lodge somewhere, unpacking the RSDIP for the next seven years. What are the priority projects? There were a treasure trove of things that we can do together with them uh, uh, in, in their strategies. And of course, there are some exciting projects. Uh, if you look at, for example, Southern Africa in terms of biodiversity, in terms of ecology, the Transfrontier Boundary Game Reserve that allows us to have our animals roaming around. There's very good way of earth observation that we can implement uh, to solve those problems. Genomics, Africa is the most genetically diverse continent. What is it in genomics that we can do? All these projects allow us to start thinking about how do we do open science through a concrete project? How do we tease out some of the challenges regarding open science? And of course, finally, Africa Open Science Platform is at the fore of encouraging dialogue there's a World Science Forum coming up in, in, in a week's time. I'll be there in Cape Town. We've got a number of sessions. We invite you to come and join us uh, in some of those sessions as and when we progress this very, very important dialogue uh, of open science. Tembiso, thank you very much for indulgence as usual. I wish I had 10 more, 20 more minutes, but I think I'll stop there and hope that those that are online have seen the vision. The vision requires all of us uh, to, to be part of it. Uh, we don't want this ship to be sailing without other passengers and then thinking, what are they doing? Very, very critical for us to start the journey together. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Musafa. I know our presenters uh, get excited <laughs> about what they, they do. Thank you for sharing with us um, the Open Science Platform, uh, the Open Science Cloud, and the collaborations that we can um, engage in when we're using our data and our infrastructure like high performance computing networks and so forth. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, for the uh, token of appreciation for your time and for your presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Mutsekwa. Thank you so much, um, uh, colleagues.